So it's a pleasure to introduce our fourth speaker, Dr. Gerard Ebel from uh, the Pasteur Institute. Uh, Dr. Ebel is a graduate of uh, the University of Lausanne and has done postdoc post training at the Ludwig Institute of Cancer Research in Lausanne and the um, New York University Skirball uh, Institute. He um, started the Lymphoid Tissue Development Unit at Pasteur and um, actually um, discovered there a new type of lymphoid cells, the innate lymphoid cells that play a fundamental role in the intestinal homeostasis with microbes and regulation of adaptive immunity. And these are recipients of awards for this work uh, from the Institute of France and the Fondation de France. So um, great to have you here, Dr. Ebert, speaking uh, to us on symbiotic microbiota and the development of the mammalian immune system. Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I saw that I'm the only non-U.S. resident in the, as a speaker, so don't grow suspicious of me, please. Uh, I will try to add a French touch to my talk, actually a Swiss uh, touch, as I'm actually Swiss. So uh, I'm an immunologist, so I won't go into too much of immunology. I'll try to, uh, to speak about a few concepts which derive from ours and others' work and uh, uh, supported with, with, with data. Um, so let me start off with these two guys. That's the French, French touch, actually, that's also German touch. Uh, so these are the two, uh, the, the, the two guys who showed uh, in the late 19th century that microbes can be vectors <coughs> of, uh, of death, of disease and death, and that is probably the most prevalent view uh, in the general public. Also recruited to the Pasteur Institute in the late 19th century is uh, Ilya Mechnikov, uh, uh, an Ukrainian-born uh, uh, physicist, physician who uh, got the Nobel Prize to, uh, 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 to his discovery when he was working in his lab in zoology in Messina in Sicily that uh, uh, cells can phagocyte microbes and, and digest them. And that was the basis of the French immunology versus the German immunology. The French immunology was was the, the cell-based uh, immunology, while the German immunology was the, uh, the antibody humoral type of uh, immunology. So, uh, uh, Machinikov, getting older, was uh, concerned about his age, and he wrote these two books. One is The Nature of Man, uh, which where he discussed that uh, uh, animals and us, in particular, are uh, immortal, and that the number of things makes us die. So that, now I crack a joke, which I easily crack in France. I don't know about the U.S. Um, so one of the things which make men die is women. Is it uh, politically incorrect? I don't know. <laughs> of course, it's just a joke. What he was discussing in his book is that the number of, uh, of uh, organisms, uh, of bacteria, um, uh, make men die, and in particular, bacteria living in the colon of the clostridia type were eating up or were proteolytic for the host and make the host die. So he wrote the second book, and uh, that's, that's an optimistic, as uh, the title uh, says, an optimistic view of aging. Um, uh, and, and that stems from his, uh, from his uh, observation or from his uh, astonishment that uh, some people in, in Bulgaria lived apparently longer than the, uh, the mean uh, uh, lifespan of Europeans. And uh, these uh, Bul Bulgarians were uh, eating uh, fermented milk, uh, which turned out to be yogurt, which is by definition fermented by Lactobacillus uh, bulgaricus. And the idea was that now good bacteria ingested would fight off bad bacteria and prolong life. So this was pretty um, philosophical at the time. Uh, there was no experiment to support this, but that's probably the birth, at least, in the literature, the birth of the probiotic thinking. Of course, the term probiotic came much later, that's coined in the 40s, as a kind of a reaction to the antibiotic. So this is a cartoon of uh, the late 19th, oh, well, beginning 20s, uh, 20th century, uh, of you know, mocking uh, Mechnikov giving uh, fermented milk to, to centenarians, the manufacture of the centenaire, the, the, the manufacture of old people, centenarians, and uh, you can see uh, and see how they get uh, the old. Okay, so this leads, of course, to concepts which uh, which I, I won't I won't uh, dwell into uh, to this audience, 
but to the notion of superorganism, that is, our identity is not just what our uh, chaotic genome tells us to be, but of course it's the addition of us and the microbiome, and together they make this superorganism. There's of course nothing to do with ferment, but just you know, a, a, an increase, a high level of organization, which makes, which makes it, I think, the, uh, the unit, the unit of evolution, where evolution is going to select for, that is the association of this eukaryotic uh, uh, genome together with the microbiota, microbiota uh, uh, genome. So this is a, a, a related to a paper uh, written by Andrew McPherson and Cathy McCoy, which just lists this most comprehensive review listing all of the defects, all the changes, the deltas you find in uh, 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 germ-free mice. This is just a piece of the table. The table runs for a number of pages of changes you find in uh, germ-free mice. We don't know the impact of all of these, but the list is, is long. And it, com it encompasses uh, immunology, immun immun immunology uh, physiology, and many, many aspects of, of the mouse function. So I'm going to go into microbiota and immunology. And this is a review uh, from, a, from a group in Zurich of Dietrich Hart, uh, uh, where he uh, proposes a number of ways microbiota protects us from, uh, from well, good bacteria protect us from bad bacteria. So these are the, the two first are the obvious uh, uh, microecological uh, uh, um, uh, micro micro uh, um, ways that is now direct inhibition or competition for, for receptors or nutrients. But the one I'm, I'm more, most interested in is, is, is this one, where now the microbiota induces a response by the host. And this response is going to protect the host from, from bad bacteria. So there's a fundamental thing I don't like in this, uh, in this cartoon is that you have these bacteria, which are the good ones, and the red ones, which are the bad ones. So for somehow, uh, in, that, in this cartoon, somehow in the thinking, in the concept, is that good bacteria induce a response, which does not now uh, target the good bacteria, but now targets the bad bacteria. I think it doesn't make sense. I'll just go run to the, to the whiteboard, because I've missed a slide. But I think there's a concept which, which is general and very, very important uh, in immunology in, in general, is that, um, so that's time, that's the amplitude of whatever response in, in that particular case, the immune system. And so when you, when you get with the trigger, for example, a, a microbe, you're going to have a response. That's a positive response. After some time, you'll have the, the negative or the, the negative feedback mechanism is going to, to kick in so that this response is, 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 is modulated down, but it, it does never. Uh, most, uh, most of the case does not go down to zero. It's going to go down to some level of non-zero. This difference here, this delta, is in general different from zero, and that is the state of equilibrium. So I think this is a general a general view of how the immune system works, not only the immune system, how a cell is triggered by a uh, receptor is going to have a, 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 any receptor is going to have a, a very fast positive uh, response followed by a negative response to go into a phase of equilibrium. The immune system is really like this. The immune system will trigger it, it has this vigorous early response, then you have the negative uh, uh, response and then you go to equilibrium. What classical immunology tells you is that uh, it goes back to zero, and then there's eradication of, of, of the invade of the pathogen. And I think this is a very rare case. In general, you have uh, reminiscent microbes in the system, and these reminiscent microbes are going to establish an equilibrium which is different from zero. And that is very important, I think, in the, uh, in the uh, interaction between us and the microbiome. So this is a... Uh, uh, um, the paper, I think a very interesting paper from Eric Pamer, uh showing how this equilibrium, which is set uh, by the symbiotic microbiota, uh, 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 how this equilibrium gives an advantage to, to the host. So uh, the experiment here is to have uh, white type mice, which have a white type microbiota, or mice which are fed with a with mix of antibiotics. And then these mice infected, 
with the vancomycin resistant enterococci, which is a, 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 a common pathogen you find in the clinics. So as you can see, it's very simple. In the wild type mice, when you infect these, uh, these, these, uh, these mice, you have a lower CSU remaining after one day. Then after five days, you basically don't find any more uh, 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 this bug, or you might find just lower levels of this bug. While now, in contrast, now if you eradicate most of the uh, intestinal microbiota, there are very high levels of this, uh, uh, of this bacteria which remain in the system. So how does it work? It's because the microbiota in the, in the intestine induces uh, uh, the production of antibacterial peptides, which is then toxic to the, um, to, to the vancomycin resistant uh, enterococci. So um, here you can see that the delta, which is different from zero, that is production of antibacterial peptides, leads to the equilibrium between the mouse, the host, and its microbiota, which is now protecting the host for infection. Now you can reverse the, you know, the thinking is that now uh, you're going to tell me, yeah, but now it's a, it's, it's a, it's a defense which leads the, this, uh, this second bug to zero, but probably not. Probably you will have some CFUs in the intestine which by themselves induce an equilibrium between the microbiome resistance bacteria and the host. So the point is equilibrium. The point is equilibrium between the host and its microbiota. And as an immunologist, um, I tend to, to think that the immune system is a very important tool for the host to establish this equilibrium. So just you know, as a general scheme, which is extremely simplistic, but sets the, the idea is that, of course, if the immune system is too weak, you will have uh, uh, increased penetration of the microbiota. And if you have too strong a response, then you will have too strong an attack on the microbiota, but this microbiota is endless, and you will have, uh, uh, you will have collateral damage and disease. So from this picture, you'll have the idea that the, the, the cure is extremely fine-tuned, that walking the fine line between this and this situation is extremely uh, difficult and fine-tuned. But that's not true. The... the, um, the um, the equilibrium between us and microbiota is extremely robust. If you take wild-type mice to try to make them sick, it's actually very difficult. Because of this phenomenon of you know, positive and negative feedback loop, going back to the, to the equilibrium is actually extremely well regulated in wild-type mouse. And to a study actually, for example, in the gut, uh, in uh, 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 inflammatory disease, IBD, uh, uh, in the gut, you have to go to research the models where now this positive and negative mechanisms are screwed up. That is, mutants of a certain number of cytokines, mechanisms which uh, 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 prevent this regulation and going into this equilibrium. And that's where now it's easy to get disease, and that's to some extent what happens, uh, what happens in, the, in, in humans. So this is just an example, which is an extreme example in the Drosophila. It's a nice example where now um, this is the situation where you have this Drosophila gut, you have these five predominant uh, uh, species Angela was talking about before, and now in this, my, uh, in this Drosophila you have a knockout of the regulation of the nf uh, pathway, and this, this fly now should react very strongly to this microbiota, one uh, killing most of it, one uh, microbe emerges, and this is actually toxic to the, to the fly meaning that now the new equilibrium without the normal regulation which has been set up in evolution for, uh, for years, if you play with that, the new equilibrium might be working but might be very toxic. Okay, so this is the general view of what I, how I see the immune system and, and its interaction with the microbes. So it tends to be very uh, realistic in our view <coughs> of the microbial world and the immune system, that is, we tend to think of microbes as good and bad, as mutualists and pathogens, and correspondingly, we tend, we tend to think of the, of the immune system as you know, pro-inflammatory, the killing bad guys, and the anti-inflammatory, the one which, which is good, which regulates the whole thing. Of course, I think it's, it's wrong. There's, there's a nice view, a, a continuum of qualities of the microbes. Of course, you can 
you can you can you can identify very strong mutualism on one end of the spectrum, very strong pathogens on the other, but most of the microbes are actually somewhere in between, and even worse, one given microbe can change its quality depending on the context. A mutualist in the gut can be good one day, but you now if you go to go surgery, it goes systemic, you can kill it. Same for the immune response. The immune response is extremely diverse. We have, you know, just have during all these years, this characterized the number of type of immune responses. But now we see that there's a lot of plasticity. The universe of type of immune responses is a n, uh, 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 inverse of n dimensions, but the, the cells go from one dimension to the other. And this makes immune response extremely plastic and diverse, which is just reflecting the complexity of the micro microbial world and the necessity to establish an equilibrium. The interesting thing is that it's a very dynamic equilibrium. The immune system adapts all the time. That's adaptive immunity, and it changes all the time. And that's very interesting for us. So let me just tell you more about what we do. Um, so we work on one branch of the adapt, or well, of the immune response, adaptive and innate, which is uh, um, which is. Uh, kind of mass regulated by a transcription factor called rho gamma t, but not only. And uh, rho gamma t positive linked for itself make up a uh, universe of cells which is associated with uh, mucosa and with tissues where you find uh, a symbiotic microbiota. So there are a number of cells. The first cells to appear are in the fetus. Uh, these are called lymphoid tissue inducer cells, and these are the cells which are responsible to induce your lymph nodes. Uh, uh, and pilot patches in the gut. Later on, after birth, you have an, uh, another type of cell, uh, which is called, uh, well, whatever it's called, uh, which is very important at mucosal tissues, in, particularly in the gut, uh, to, uh, to participate in, in the confinement of the microbiota after birth and during the lifetime. After, uh, 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 there are also other cells which are kind of programmed uh, in the thymus, gamma delta cells, environment MKT cells, which produce the same type of cytokines like R17 and R22, which is uh, stereotypical of this pathway. And then uh, during, uh, uh, during uh, exposure with microbes, gives the generation of this very now fashionable TH17 cells, which are also important in mucosal immunity to the production of R17 and R22, which, for instance, induce very efficiently epithelial uh, uh, defense through the production of antibacterial peptides, for example. So uh, this pathway is, I think, very interesting. If you go back to this animal, which you all know, um, which is uh, Strongylocentrus preparatus, which is sea urchin. And you go look for genes which look like genes we have in our genome uh, uh, related to immunology. And you look at those which are related to our cytokines, you can see that there are, there are more like 30 genes which are IL-17-like. So you might think that this is a very old pathway and kind of makes sense because now we have gut since a long time, we're in contact with microbiota since a long time, so it makes sense that this mechanism of containing microbiota is around since a long time, which you now uh, um, uh, um, gives value to what I do because I can always say this is a very old pathway which should study at all costs. Um, this pathway is, um, is uh, as I mentioned just two slides uh, uh, ago, uh, is, um, uh, is carried by two types of cells, the T cells and the innate infrared cells. So you all know the T cells, they come in different flavors. Uh, we thought uh, for long that these were the regulators of adaptive immunity. Uh, since a number of years, we have come to recognize the existence of these innate lymphoid cells, which look like T cells, except they don't have a T cell receptor. They do the same in terms of cytokines they produce, or in terms of what type of immunity they do, they don't, they don't see antigens. They react to the environment. They react to, to the cytokine environment. They react to how the tissue um, <coughs> is itself reacting to uh, outside clues. But we still don't really understand how, how that works. So let me just tell you a few tales about these ones. That is the ones which are making R17 and R22. So the story begins with this, uh, this thing, which is the development of lymphoid tissue of lymph nodes. And that's, that's pretty remarkable, because only mammals, only mammals do in, uh, lymph nodes. So uh, birds do, turtles do, but these do in response to microbial invasion. 
Mammals have learned to preempt. That's the next stage. We have learned how to live with microbes. Mammals in that, in that, in, in, in that process have learned to um, preempt the inevitable colonization of their gut or of their system by microbiota. So what happens is that these cells, these green cells, uh, are going to be recruited to sites where you're going to develop lymph nodes and pious patches in the gut. And what they do is to replicate an inflammation. What you see here in the sterile environment of the fetus is actually a generation of uh, an inflammatory loci. This is inflammation. You can see some markers of typical markers of inflammation uh, in adults. You will have the generation of cytokines and chemokines. You will have the recruit, recruitment of, lymph, uh, of lymphocytes as if it would be a, a genuine inflammation, and then the formation of a lymph node. And actually, if you have an infection in adults and this gets chronic, you will do the same. You will do the infant tissue with time. But the mammals have preempted this. It's pretty cool. And this is probably the, the origin of it, and that's in the gut after birth. In the gut after birth, what you see is that in mouse, you can see this, this constellation of these uh, small clusters of these what we call it, GI cells, and you can see small ones, which are only uh, uh, done of SGI cells, and big ones, which are full of B cells. And we knew that this is absolutely dependent on microbiota. If you don't have microbes, you just stay at that stage. And what we showed together with Ivo Bonecke at the, at the Pasteur is that it goes this way. So what you have is that you have gram-negative microbes in the gut um, uh, dividing, they have to deconstruct the cell wall. They have to, the, one of the consequences is to release peptidoglycans, which are seen by a very old molecule that are also found in plants, which is NOD1 in epithelial cells. NOD1 uh, activated epithelial cells are going to produce a number of things like these chemokines and defensins, which are going to activate these clusters. These clusters are going to attract B cells to make lymphoid tissue. The job of lymphoid tissue is to make, uh, is to generate uh, uh, mature lymphocytes and B cells are going to generate IgA again against the microbiota. So basically, the more microbes you have, the more you induce this uh, this uh, this uh, process, the more you do ILS, the more uh, these lymphatic tissues, the more IgA you produce, and the more IgA you produce, the more you block that process. Which is exactly what I'm talking about since the beginning. That is this positive and then negative feedback, which leads to inevitably to an equilibrium. This is a perfect example, I think, of how the immune system actually works. That is the trigger. The more you have, the more you react to. The more you react to, the more you do to prevent that trigger. And that must lead not to a zero eradication, but just to an equilibrium. And actually, that we were, when we did these experiments, we were, um, we were led to, to, to think about the experiments by the work of Margaret uh, in, 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 in the squid. And actually, actually, a very similar uh, phenomenon happens in a squid. And actually, the same molecule which is playing in the gut in the mouth is playing out in the symbiotic uh, system in the squid, where now a gram-negative bacteria is activating the system of the squid and inflammation. And this leads then, this helps for monocolization of the squid by this video. Um, I'm going to cut short, but let me explain to you this thing which looks complex, it is. So this is the, 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 the type of cells I was talking to you about in the fetus, but it's actually more complex. This is a mix of them. So here you have five types of these cells. Before birth, you have basically these two types of cells, which are these ones, which are clustering, <coughs> making this inflammation and triggering the formation of lymphoid tissues. Around birth, it's quite remarkable. You have this reshuffling of this population, a total reshuffling. Now you have your clusters are done, and you reuse the cells to make something else. These cells are now mobilized to be uh, isolated as factors, which are going to uh, interact much more with epithelial cells and promote epithelial immunity. So if you see that, it looks like quite obvious that the microbiota is driving this. So now if you look in germ free, so in black. Oh, in gray, you have STF mice, and in and, and, and white, you have germ freeze. If you look at uh, T cells, and this we know since a number of years, if you look at T cell numbers in the gut, we know that there's a tenfold decrease of 
T cell numbers in the gut, and more specifically those uh, carrying type 17 immunity, uh, which is important for containment, uh, they are they drop by hundredfold. But you can see that these cells here, these innate infant cells, don't drop at all. Which again tells you there is a programmation, there is a preemptation, preemptation, preemptation of what's going to happen inevitably. That is after birth, you're going to change totally the 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 the, uh, the, the environment of the gut. That is, there is going to be a, a colonization, and the system adapts. But in the, in the mammalian gut, it's pre adapts so let me uh, go over this uh, to to the to, to this uh, to this slide here. So what, what I just t uh, told you is that before birth, of these cells which are preempting the colonization of the gut by uh, formation of lymphoid tissues, and then just before birth, they're going to reshuffle and readjust the populations to actually uh, 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 increase the efficiency to, of the epithelial cells to equilibrate with the microbiota. But there's another thing that I didn't tell you, is that before birth, they do tons of IL-17 out 22 What is that good for in the fetus? You don't have, as, as far as we know, we don't have, you don't have contact with microbiota. So what is that good for? And actually, we think, we haven't tested this, we have to, we think that they start to do very high levels of IL-17 out 22 because, again, you're going to be colonized. And we think this is a very strong selective pressure on those micro microbes which are, will be able to uh, producti productively uh, colonize uh, the intestine. And now what we saw is that very fastly, before weaning, these levels drop dramatically to levels which are then the levels we find in adults which are much lower. Ring the bell, right? It goes back to what I, what I draw on the, on the whiteboard. This, uh, this, uh, this, this triggered very fast and then it drops and then goes to equilibrium level. And what we found is that, of course, the negative feedback comes from the microbiota. Once they, are sele once they come in, once they are, the few ones uh, uh, are selected, they're going to interact with the epithelial cells to make a cytokine, which is out 25, and it feeds back negatively on the production of these things to reach an equilibrium. Again, you have this trigger, positive and negative feedback, loop, which leads to this equilibrium. Uh, needless to say that when now you, you, uh, you have an infection or a, a trauma in the gut, this is, uh, goes back to, to total full-blown IL-17 alternative production until you reach an equilibrium. Okay, just one last word is that uh, what is also interesting is that this period before weaning is extremely important. It's more than just response and equilibrium with microbiota. If the same happens in the adults, you kind of go into this curve of activation and then going back to negative regulation and to equilibrium. It's much more than that. It's also development and programming of the immune response. And let me just mention uh, uh, one word from, from Rick, showing, you're going to talk probably about it, but uh, showing how important this pre-weaning uh, uh, period is important for the whole life and changes how the immune system is going to react. This is also reminiscent of a, of a, of a word by Brett Finlay, who shows uh, it's more phenomenologically uh, the impact of uh, tampering with the microbiota uh, um, before we... Okay, let me just skip all this. That was ambitious. Um, ah, just this example of, of skip, of course, uh, this wonderful uh, review uh, telling you that you are full of viruses, but probably for the good and sometimes for the bad, it depends. This equilibrium uh, is dependent on you and on the microbiota, but if you change, and you talk about it in your review, if you change because you are immunosuppressed because of transplant, it changes the whole game, and you might be actually uh, 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 in danger from the same bacteria which might help you during the whole life to establish a clear room with the microbiota. Okay, this is my team in, uh, in Paris, and most of the work I showed you was done by Shinichi Rosawa, a Japanese postdoc, by Marie Cherrier, a French postdoc, and uh, and uh, Kaspar and Mark, uh, a German post. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, any clarifying questions from the forum to Dr. Ebert? If not, let me invite uh, the question for, yes, go ahead. 
Gerard, um, it's hard that, that one slide you showed with the uh, germ-free versus SPF with respect to the LTI. Do you think that in the axionic animals that there is a, a truly axionic, axionic moms uh, giving birth to axionic uh, pups, that there are microbial factors that are um, um, coming in through the moms and regulating the, the fetus because it, it sort of implies that your hypothesis is that um, there's an anticipation, a host anticipation of microbiota, but might it be that the, there's actually signals that are coming in through the, that might be microbial derived through the placenta uh, into the, into the, into the, uh, it has to be. to the host. And well, one of my posts, I was tired to hear me saying that, you know, the, that the fetal environment is dry. And uh, the idea she had is that just from food, from uh, bacterial fragments, from lamps in the food, uh, uh, these could be transferred to the placenta in the fetus and then induce these things. So we generated lamp-free mice. So we uh, uh, germ-free mice with, uh, uh, with uh, synthetic food and with exactly the same. There's no impact on, on, on these processes. Given the known differences in the uh, state of maturity of the immune system uh, at birth between mice and humans, I'm wondering uh, if you can comment on what is known about the biology that you're describing in, in human <coughs> DNA with respect to ILC and TH7. I don't know much about human. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> uh, what we know about human immune system is more advanced at birth. That's for sure. Uh, what we know from the processes of uh, lymphoid tissue development are also more advanced, but you basically find the same cell. You basically find the same cell, and it changes so much. But uh, 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 frankly, not, not too many people work on these cells uh, uh, in human, and we don't know much about their activity in terms of what I mentioned, our 17 or 22 production at, at birth. Now, in particular, I was wondering about what role the microbiota might play that would be different in, in humans as opposed to uh, driving that development? Um, in, well, again, I don't know much. As probably some people in the room can tell you more. But in terms of the types of microbes you find at birth in mice, in humans, they're pretty similar. There's this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, dominance of protobacteria very early at birth, which is followed by the dominance of lactobacteria, which is probably driven by milk. And then it goes into you know, the classic bacteria and in semiculture. So in terms of the dynamic, at least dynamic, at least of microbiota, it looks pretty similar. In terms of, in terms of the immune system, again, um, I'm not the one to talk to. Thank you very much.